Let's get started. Let me put my phone in airplane mode here. There we go. Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Carlos Perez and welcome to this webinar on attack simulation TDPs. On this specific webcast, we're going to be talking specifically about group policy and audit setting uh, enumeration. So let me tell you about our mission here at Trusted Sec. Um, we, we focus mainly to be at the forefront of attack simulation. We work very hard on that to be, we, we look at threat intel, we we'll look at tools out there, we look at our customer environment and we work very hard to make sure that we're ahead of the game here so we can pr uh, provide you guys quite a bit of uh, information at the same time help our customers uh, secure their environment the best they can. Uh, in addition to that, we focus on strategic risk management. Um, as I mentioned, our goal is to change the security industry, is, is to make it for the better. And that's why we're sharing all of this information as much as we can. So what are the main areas uh, and what makes us dif uh, different from everybody else? In addition of what I already mentioned, um, how do we ensure that we're at the front? We have the adversary emulation and threat and research team. I'm part of that team. I'm currently the lead uh, in the research side. I've worked with a group of super smart people uh, that write all of our internal tools. In addition to that, we're constantly looking for new ways of performing attacks and finding uh, new tradecraft that we can leverage uh, in our customer engagements. In addition to that, uh, we do integrate, um, we, we look very deep in terms of our, how does our customers perform their actions. And to that, we bring in the experience of everybody inside of uh, Trusted Sec to participate and help us. So, for example, we can go into a customer that is in banking and we'll bring people that have worked in that environment and can bring value into it. And this allows us to tailor our services specifically to our customers. That's why we mentioned here integrated risk management. In addition to that, one of our main goals is to be a trusted partner and a friend to our customer. We are that trusted advisor. And the only way we can be that is when we're completely honest with you, we share our TTPs, we share information, and we ensure that everything we do is to ensure that you have success. So that's the approach that we have, which makes it quite different. Um, not going to talk much about myself. I'm a technical guy, so I'd rather go into the technical stuff. Um, I'm, I work out of Puerto Rico. Um, I have quite a bit of experience in this field. I'm kind of year 21, 22. I actually started in 98 uh, working in security, uh, securing networks in addition to that, performing penetration tests internally. So you can say it was a bit of... Um, Red teaming back then and back in the good old days. In addition to that, I've presented in multiple conferences. Uh, I write quite a bit of code and put it out there, multiple open source projects. In addition to that, uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP in the Arab Data Center. And my specialties as a Microsoft MVP is enterprise security and PowerShell. As I mentioned, I run the research team. Uh, the main goals that we have inside of the research team is to work on TTPs, tactic techniques, and procedures for our teams. Uh, this comes from our members inside of the team that have worked for multiple three-letter agencies. It comes from people in the industry that have been performing all of this tax for many years. Um, we, we're constantly looking at and research what is in our customers' environments, what have we done that has yielded good effect, areas where we can improve, we leave the ego out the door when we do our hot watches and we go like, 
hey, I did this and this and this in this event. Uh, it could have gone better if I would have done it this other way or if our tools did it this way. And my team will gather all of that information from our operators and will work in customizing the tools, coming up with new TTPs for them. Uh, in addition to that, we work very closely with our red team and incident response team. So not only are we writing offensive tooling, uh, but in addition to that, we are feeding all of that information into our incident response team. And we're also helping our incident response team uh, by writing tools specifically for them. And in addition to that, providing IOCs and new techniques. So typically what we look at is we look at the attack chain and we find those links in the attack chain that would be of most value for them for containment, most value for them in terms of detection. And we look at making sure that they have the proper IOCs and proper ways of finding bad guys in the network. Um, I know this slide says, lead by a renowned tactical instructor and researcher. <laughs> Just notice that, this is a new slide. Didn't know that they actually added that. So yeah, I used to be a tactical instructor. So if all of a sudden you see me go a bit on the militaristic side on how um, we operate, it is, I come from with that mentality. So let's get to it. So here's just a list of the services that we provide. As you can see, we're not only doing penetration testing, insert response, we do quite a bit more. Uh, and I really want to point out how our security assessments, software security assessments. In, a, in, a, in addition to that, we also do program maturity assessment, virtual CSO, and we also do training in addition to multiple other services. So uh, do look at those when you're looking uh, for people in that area to assist you. So let's get into the nitty gritty, enough marketing. Uh, so if you've been to my other webinars, you know that I have kind of like this matrix or this series of steps that I follow when we get inside of an environment. So we land in a system, all of a sudden, we have our child. First thing I tell students, first thing I tell our operators is you need to know where and who. We, we need to know under what process are we running at, under what privileges. So because our behavior can will be dictated by that. So all of a sudden, hey, we're running a system under SVC host. Last thing I want to bring up is Notepad as a sub process and inject into it. That's going to, going to look off. Also, let's say I'm just network service. I just landed and I decided, hey, I'm network service. Let me migrate into Explorer because I'm used to always landing as a user. And in this case, we went up to our SQL server and it was only running as network service. If we don't know the where and who, we're going to be making mistakes. Once we know where and who, uh, and who we are in this system, we work on identifying controls. Hey, what is the things in this system that can get me caught? What are the things in the system that will hamper my operations? And then we'll profile the system. Hey, who's the owner of this system? What does this system do? Um, and just by knowing this initial set of information, this will dictate my tool set and tempo uh, of operations. And then after that, if need be, we can persist on the system. We'll quickly look and pilfer data from the system and just knowing like who are the users of the system will determine how am I going to pilfer this system? How am I going to find that data, extract it, uh, and then once I've done with the system itself, I'm going to decide on moving laterally if I need to. Um, for example, one of our cases was that we've landed in machines, let's say for the CEO's assistant. Does it make sense for us to keep moving if we have access to the CEO's email? And the goal of the exercise is competitors gaining access to our trade secrets. Probably not. So I, I consider that a win. So we are going to, uh, once we have that win, we'll still keep moving, we'll, but we're not under that time crunch to move faster. And just by knowing where we are becomes very important. Uh, and I mentioned this specific story because I've seen many, many cases of friends of mine, people I meet, quickly move into a system. They don't even check 
who uses that system and all of a sudden they're kettle roasting the entire network uh, for all service accounts and trying to move laterally and going after DA and not taking uh, the proper steps. Then they get caught and they go like, oh no, the customer security was super awesome. And it turned out to be that you were not following proper TTPs. That's why I'm kind of a bit anal about that. Uh, then we move traditional harvesting, then we do our lateral movement as need be. But in this specific uh, webinar, we're going to be focusing on identifying controls and profiling the system. And this is a series of techniques that I've been using for quite a while, and I haven't seen them mentioned out there. I've seen them in other tools. So I decided to talk about it, and this is GPOs. Now, why GPOs? I know many of you are wondering, hey, GPOs are dead. Well, they're not. People keep saying they're dead, but I haven't found one single environment where people are not using it. So still the number one management tool if you're in AD environment. In addition to that, the information about the GPOs, which cover the controls, auditing, and a lot of other information is catch on the system. So it, let's say that my phishing campaign was able to get into, uh, enabled me to get into the machine of somebody and he was in the office, a mobile user. Um, just by looking at all of this GPO information, I can get a quite a good idea on how their AD may be structured or what is their security posture in the environment from when they do connect into that corporate network. I have a very good sense on the maturity level in terms of security that my target has. Oops, got ahead. So typically, when we're working with GPOs, um, the user and, or, and machine, when they log on into AD, they're going to look for link GPOs that are specific to them inside of AD. This will be dictated by the domain and under what OU they're actually located under. Then they're going to pull from, Sysmo, from Sysvol their settings and all of that information, they're going to cache that locally, and then it's going to get processed locally. And as all of that stuff get, it's getting processed, it's going into the registry, and it's saving all of that information, uh, kind of like a history and details and all of that stuff inside of the registry. So it can then check, hey, do I need a new update? Do I need to check this GPO? Has it passed 90 minutes or not? Um, when was the last time that I actually updated this? Uh, and all of that stuff, uh, information is actually saved in the registry and we're going to be looking at using that. Now the tool set that we're going to be using, it is a brand new project that we actually put out today. It is called Honey Badger. Um, yes, I know it's a funny name. Uh, internally, almost all of my guys work for tree litter agencies and all of our projects are named like this. Uh, so this is an internal project um, that I got permission to actually make public. So it, it is actually a collection of Metasploit modules and a plugin specifically for aiding in red teaming and pen testing engagements. Now, the main goal of why we're putting out there, uh, it is twofold. First of all, is to share with the community itself, hey, these are tradecraft techniques that you guys can use for your engagements. And on the case of Blue, hey, hey make sure, uh, this is information that it is out there, guys. Don't think that this information is not accessible to an attacker. Um, and, and as I mentioned, it's just sharing that tradecraft and educating others uh, and just being a good member of the tribe. Um, the project is completely open source. It's licensed under the triple BSD license. So you guys can fork it, you guys can uh, do pull requests into it, uh, you, can, you guys can merge it into other tools as long as the um, copyright header is included. So I, uh, we decided to use a very flexible license so you guys can use it in, in your projects and also to share it. It's available in our GitHub. So if you go into GitHub, trust sec Honey Badger, you're going to find it there. So let's go straight into the demo of what I'm describing here. If you go into trust a sec here, you'll uh, in our GitHub, you'll find the module. I pushed all of this stuff today. I know there's no ASCII art. 
I'm going to be working on it. Um, I know several people inside of the company mentioned it. Um, th that cannot be an official trusted sec project if it doesn't have ASCII art. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. So here's the project itself. Um, let's look at the code that we're going to be running here. Or in fact, just let, let me go first on the GPO stuff so you guys understand this. So as a user, when you're logging into your environment in AD, your, your computer and your account are going to go and pull all of those GPOs from Syswall and cache them in your machine. The place that they're going to be cached initially is under C Windows System 32 Group Policy Data Store. And then we're going to have uh, number zero, Syswall, and then for your domain name. In this case, uh, my domain is acmelabs.pvt. And then under policies, it's going to add a series of folders. Each one of these folders, the name is the GUID, which is inside of AD is known as the name. But it's a GUID to identify each one of those GPOs inside of AD. And their data is going to be cached. And we can go in here. In this case, it has machine settings. Um, I can go here and has a registry policy, has a folder called Microsoft Windows NT, set edit, and then the template with all of the info on what is actually being. And in this case, it is uh, Kerberos policy, LSS policy, password policy. Now, normally a user cannot read all this stuff. This stuff is protected from a user. The most a user can do is actually when it goes in is enumerate all of this uh, goods, which is kind of good, kind of bad. My initial take on this was when I found all of this information a couple of years ago, I was so excited. Hey, here are all of the goods. I'm going to create AD. I'm going to use ADSI and a bunch of .NET. I'm going to pull all of this information from AD so I can get the details. Then I found out that um, after using um, Process Explorer uh, and Procmon, I noticed that it was open in the registry when it was processing all of the GPOs. And I looked and there was this registry key called group policy uh, under HQ local machine, Microsoft Windows current version group policy. I go into it and all of a sudden, here's all of the information about all of those group policies that got processed. And it's readable by any authenticated user in the box. Oh, oh this is awesome. And the registry keys I wanna point out to you guys is if I go here into data store and I go here, let's say under machine, which is the current machine I am under, you'll see that there's a number zero here. And when I look into it, I'm gonna find quite a bit of information about the machine. I'm going to find the machine DN. This is very useful when you're working in AD and you're doing enumerations and you're doing stuff in the environment uh, because it gives you quite a bit of a structure. All of a sudden I know that this machine is part of the accounting OU and there's another OU called computers. Hmm. So now I have a kind of a bit of an idea on how it is structured. Also, I see that my domain controller is TDC1 and I'm in the default first site name. So getting a bit more information about where am I located in this environment. Also, I know when was the last time that the GPO got applied. So typically it is last time that, that it was updated on the machine itself. Now, just in case, if you guys have any questions, you can go into the Q&A panel and just enter them. You can even vote on questions, just in case. Let me check. Uh, so far, no questions? Okay. But you can make questions at any time. Then we're going to see a series of folders under here. And under each folder, it's going to be each one of the group policy objects that get processed for this machine. So all of a sudden I have one here that is called disable Windows scripting host. It is telling me, hey, this GPO is located here inside of AD under policy system. 
Uh, here are all of the extensions that are, are associated to it, which is just general, it's not the specific setting, it is just the type of setting that got applied. So this may give us an idea. Here's the location if I need to pull it in the case that they're running scripts or they're doing something else, depending on the extension. Uh, another thing I can actually see here is where was it linked? So in this case, this is a specific group policy that is specifically applied to the computer's OU. Now, if I look at the others, and in my case, I'm, I'm a researcher, so I'm geeking out on all of the technical stuff. So this webinar is a technical one, just in case. Um, and here we have another one. And if we look at this one, this one's specific to the domain, and this is default domain policy. So this will give me an idea also on how the GPOs are being structured and applied inside of the environment. For example, some of the GPOs could have been applied not only to the main level, but also they could have been applied at a lower OU level. So I don't know about you guys, but as a offensive attack emulator, Red Team or Pen Tester, call it what you want. This is useful information for me inside of the environment. You know, all of a sudden, now I have a, an idea on how Active Directory is structured. I have an idea on what is actually being set. For example, I, I can just look at the display name, PowerShell Login Settings. We have another one, Workstation Enhanced Auditing Policy. We have another one, Disable Windows Scripting Host. Now, in addition to this, other information that is being gathered is that we get the sets for each of the users that have logged on into this machine and what group policy got processed. So all of a sudden, now I have a history of all users that logged on into this machine. And this includes the entire CN of where that user is located, the domain, and in addition to that, what is the date? So I know that um, a Justine has been logged on in quite a bit in a couple of days. So still useful information. And if all of a sudden I decide to start looking a bit deep, deeper here, um, if I go here to the sits, it also includes for me what groups they're a member of. All of those sits and all of those sits are known. So all of a sudden, if I go here, I found out that the owner of this sit is 512. This is um, a domain admin user. So all of a sudden, I may know if I have a user here on this box that is domain admin. In addition to that, I have uh, other groups, uh, 512 domain admin, 500 is, uh, 513 is a domain user, uh, we have a couple other more here. Um, I'm just going out from memory. Let's look at the questions. Can GPOs be used for persistent? Yes. If the settings are not set properly and your user is able to modify those settings uh, at the OU level, you can actually modify and use that to add registry keys execute programs or do whatever you need for persistence. A tool like Bloodhound will be perfect there. Um, if you don't have access to the registry, uh, you can do GP results scope user V. Correct, but if you're in a system that's running Endgame, CrowdStrike, um, Silence, uh, and there are other EDRs out there, this is going to get you caught. Uh, there, it's going to, get flag, uh, even um, carbon black. I've seen rules in carbon black for this. And if you have had the pleasure of working with Ben 10 in our team, uh, Ben is in charge of all of our purple teaming and he has a series of rules over the preset uh, that he helps customers deploy and he does look for that kind of behavior. So yeah, it is a, a command line tool that can allow you to do this, but I try to focus as much as possible on using uh, in my agents, agents that have the capability of reading the registry that are using native APIs. For example, I like using Cobalt Strike, Metasploit, plus our internal one, uh, 
all three of those, when it comes to registry, everything is using internal APIs and we're not running uh, other tools. In addition, we, on all three of them, we have the capabilities of Green AD and we shy away of using um, stuff like PowerShell or VBScript, J, JScript, or any of the other tools that the target environment may have telemetry on. For example, MC. Uh, MC will report on that type of information. I think that is what reading, I think that is what is reading in the registry. Uh, yeah, it's actually reading the registry. Also, there's uh, result set VBS script that comes with Windows that actually does that also. Can they see you running PowerShell v2 commands? Um, Endgame does, they use ETW for that. Some other vendors, what they see is that if you're running Windows 10 and there's a v2 engine that runs, it will get flagged. In case of the logs, there's the law event ID 400 in um, the Windows PowerShell log that it will include the uh, engine version and that will get flagged also uh, because they'll say, hey, this environment has always been Windows 10. It has always ran 5.1. All of a sudden we see the version two engine coming up and that gets flagged as a bypass. And in fact, one of the things that we're seeing in many, many of our customer environments is that they're uninstalling the version, the V2 engine from all of their client hosts to prevent uh, attackers from downgrading into PowerShell version two, bypassing MC and bypassing all of the other PowerShell controls. Good questions. So let's look at the code so far and let's take a look at Honey Badger itself. here. So typically what I'll do is I'll download all of the Honey Badger uh, folders inside of my .ms4 folder. So you're going to have a local folder with a process DB that is um, dangerous processes that I tend to keep in a database for EC, or EC query. So I don't have to have kind of like a gigantic hash table or something like that. Actually stole this from the Chatter Brokers and I've been keeping it updated and uh, I just keep adding more stuff to it as we keep finding uh, in customer environments. In addition to that, we're going to have our plugins folder. Inside of the plugins folder is going to be Honey Badger. And it's just a, a plugin that helps me automate the other modules. And then the modules folder, so far all of them are post-exploitation enumeration. So post-exploitation windows gather and you'll have multiple um, modules here. All of them start with TS for trustedsec underscore. So I check for command line logging, if it is a VM, pipe names. This is useful for when you're pivoting inside of the environment and you wanna make sure that, you're, uh, that the name pipe that you're using looks like a real name pipe that it exists in the environment. You'll be surprised how some of the more modern EDR solutions and also some of the more finely tuned blue teams out there are actually triggering on pipe names. I collect these services, dangerous process, get policy info. Get policy info is the one where I'm actually leveraging the information that you guys saw there that I was mentioning about group policies. So let's take a look at the module itself. So the module, once it starts, uh, one of the first things I check is hey, is this box part of a domain, yes or no? Um, the way I, I do that is I simply go in and I'll do get domain, I'll go into registry, group policy history. I'm going to say, hey, is there a domain controller name here? If there is a domain controller registry key, that means that this machine has logged into a domain controller and at the very least the default domain policy has been applied to it. Now with this piece of information, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to get the group policy inf uh, info. So I simply go into that registry key. I look at it. 
And since the machine zero, we only have one single machine. We, uh, so this zero is always going to be given. It's always going to be zero. It's not going to be zero, one, two, three, because the machine only has one single account. So that is stored policy machine zero. I enumerated all of those register keys. I collect the information, GPO name, display name, link, file system, um, of the DN, the extensions, and all of that stuff then gets displayed to you. Oops, what happened here? Uh, darn you, um, code. Why did you hit my code? Here we go. And all this stuff then is saved as a note. Uh, so you guys can create this stuff inside of Metasploit itself. Then what I'm going to do, and this is something that has been known for a while, but also haven't seen many tools, is that when you use the advanced auditing settings, all of those settings get pushed to the machine inside of a CSV file. Before, back in the 2003 Windows XP days, when we were working in an environment and we wanted to get what were the audit settings set on the machine, we actually had to read the registry and we had to read it at system or as domain admin, which was troublesome. Now, nowadays what happens is inside of each one of those GPOs, the settings are uh, actually pushed to the machine as a CSV, which is readable by authenticated users. So for me as an attacker, this means that now I have an idea specifically what are you logging? in this machine. And since I'm paranoid, and I know that there's a ton of settings, another thing I do is I grab all of those settings and I check what is enabled and I do tradecraft checks to make sure, hey, Carlos, don't do this. This will get you caught. Don't do this. This is going to get logged. And I add all of this information, which I can then query from the database. Uh, in the case I have one single database, multiple consoles use the same database. So any user can go like, hey, let me check this host out. Let me check the notes first. And let me look specifically for host log asterisk to check what is being logged. And I know that not to touch or execute actions in it. So if we go here, one of the things I can just do is I can use post windows gather TS collect uh, not collect it was get policy info uh, sessions I have one session set session one and let me just run it ah, the mo gods were nice to me today um, so here we have all of that information about each one of the group policy objects. Just by looking at this, we can have an idea, hey, PowerShell settings, PowerShell's being logged. I know that they're doing some enhanced logging here, and I know that they're disabling Windows scripting hosts on the target machine. So this means I have to be very careful with Windows scripting hosts, BB script, J script, or HTA files. Then I pulled the CSV, I consolidated multiple advanced audit settings because there could be multiple audit settings. So what I did is I copied all of those CSVs, deduped them and show you the information here. This is the auditing settings currently on the machine. So you can take a better um, decision on what tools you're going to be using and how fast are you going to move in that environment? Because, hey, all of the controls dictate the tools and tempo of the attacker. And then I have my tradecraft notes. Hey, scheduled task actions are being audited. Anything I do with scheduled tasks, going to be audited. File registry and share access can be logged. Local SAM access is audited. So if I try to, uh, I decided to be smart and not do a hash dump where I go inside of the LSAS process memory, I decide to go after the SAM file and I decide to read that file, um, yeah, that's going to be audited on what process actually read the same file. Um, process creation, Windows startup shutdowns logged. Um, if a highly privileged user is logged on, this is 
useful if all of a sudden I'm pivoting to this machine, I'm trying to do um, or, or to log into it with stolen credentials, it's going to get logged. Um, if a screensaver, remote desktop connections are logged, account logout events are logged. So I kind of mentioned some stuff that you have to keep in mind when you're working in the environment. And all of that, if we go into notes, all of this information is safe here. So you have host log settings. So here we have all of those settings. Uh, next part of the plugin is to actually be able to parse all of this information given a host. If we have want the information on controls, they're safe on their host controls. And here I have all of the GPO settings saved. And here for each one of the areas where I'm saying, hey, be careful with this. I'm also adding, hey, scheduled tasks are being logged, enabled, true, rec share, access, true, SAM access, true. So you guys have an idea of what you can do, what can you cannot do on the host. And the reason that I'm putting all of this stuff inside of the database is because nowadays, most of your red team engagements and most of your pen testing engagements are done in teams. So typically what you're going to be doing is you're starting the uh, database, so msfdb uh, status. So I have it running, it is running in web mode, and what, what it means, if I go here and do uh, db status. My connection to the database is over HTTPS, so I can have multiple consoles connected to this database. And each one of the operators is working independently. But if they go inside of the database, they're going to be able to share information with one another. In this case, we can look at the controls. Now, typically, I don't like going by IP. We have been in a handful of customers, not many, they have a very short DHCP lifespan. And I'm trying to um, see if I can use another value like the machine go it uh, to do queries. And that will be more than likely in a future version of the module itself. Another module where I'm actually abusing the information there is TS host info. So I'm not gonna bore you too much going through the code, but TS host info so options set make my life simpler set G session one and it runs I get a bit of information about the host hey um, name of the host domain type of Windows Windows 10 build 17763, X64, six current users logged on. So that's typically service accounts uh, in Windows 10 every time you log on. Your user is going to actually have two logons. One is highly privileged, the other is not. That is for when you have uh, UAC enabled and you, you and it asks you if uh, you get the UAC prompt and you click OK, you actually switch contacts from one account, one logon to another logon to log on that have more privileges. So typically users will have two logon sessions normally. And then here I'm getting basic domain membership information like, hey, here's where you're located inside of AD. This is your site. This is your domain controller. This is domain FQDN. And if you're going to be doing ADSI queries, here is the DN that you can start using for leveraging ADSI inside of Metasploit. And then I have a user history. Hey, these are all of the users that have logged on into this machine. It has a, a local user uh, called Carlos. It has uh, the domain administrator logged on into this machine and then a Justine uh, logged on into this machine. So all of a sudden, I land in a box and I can identify, for example, if somebody's doing Nessus I'm going to see an account here called Nessus underscore scan or Nessus scanner, or I'm going to be looking at other types of domain 
accounts that may be logging into my environment. And when I look at that membership history, hey, they can be domain admins. And that is account that I can just look for the logon, steal the Cabros ticket, uh, or I can steal a token and then use to move laterally. So initially I just landed the box, run this module, and I have quite a bit of information and can start planning a series of actions that I can do. Now you're, you're probably saying, hey, Carlos, that's a couple of modules that you have there. We don't want to run all of those modules. And that's why I actually created a plugin for this. So if we look at the plugin itself, and we go here into Honey Badger. Uh, so far, it has one single command. It's called host survey. And it will run most of the commands that will gather information and put all of that stuff inside of the database. So I'm checking the WMI Security Center, Windows Scripting Host Controls, PowerShell Controls, Collection of Services, Dangerous Processes, uh, Policy Information, uh, I'll check if it is a VM or not. So if all of a sudden I have here, for example, let's say PowerShell um, running here in the environment. Let me download Process Explorer. This is internals. Let's say somebody thinks that their machine has been compromised and they're running other tools. That's what I'm prepping here for demo. A little bit running. Let's go over here. Let's load our plugin. Load. Honey Badger tells me that it loaded successfully. I can go into help. And when I go help for the console, I have here situational awareness commands, and here is host survey. So let's look at host survey itself. Host survey minus H, and I can, it has only one option, minus S, where I can specify a specific session, multiple sessions, one comma, three comma, seven, if I wanna target some specific sessions, or I can just say minus S all, and it will run against all sessions. So I can just do host survey minus S, let's do all. And all of those modules will actually be ran for me. And it will collect all of that information and all of that information will be saved inside of uh, the database as notes, which I can then query. I can parse, I can write my own uh, resource script to probably export this into a nice PDF, export it into tables, or just look for other information that I can trigger on. So for example, here I have TS, WMI Security Center. It looked at it and said, hey, it has uh, as antivirus, it has Windows Defender, and has silence protect. And then register as an anti-spyware, it has Windows Defender and also silence. So this box is actually running silence in addition to uh, Defender. Uh, I checked in the case of uh, Windows scripting host, I can see that there's a policy and that error messages are being suppressed. So it's going to block and it's not going to show me an error message when it blocks Windows scripting host. It's looking for PowerShell controls. There are none. That means probably I can use PowerShell. Here's a list of the services that I collected. And this is a dangerous process one. So as it was running, all of a sudden it's telling me, hey, I found a couple of dangerous processes here on this machine running. Silence Protect was found. Process Explorer was also found in terms of security products. And also admin tools that is saying, hey, PowerShell's running in addition to Process Explorer. I see two instances of Process Explorer. So all of a sudden, I'm putting out there in red for you like, hey, be careful. Um, somebody's running some tools that may get you caught or they're looking for you. And in addition to all of the other info. So Honey Badger simply takes all of those modules that I wrote uh, 
made available for you guys and automates their execution. And uh, in addition to that, I wanted to specifically talk about all of those GPO settings and how you can actually abuse that registry key to gather quite a bit of information. It is kind of like a piece of tradecraft that has been passed along in multiple forums and Slack channels, but nobody has actually made it public or talked about it. And we're like, oh, this would be a nice subject or something to share uh, with the community at large. So do you guys have uh, questions so far? If I go back here into PowerPoint, we are just in the, at the end in the question section. So uh, any questions? Really good training. Thank you, Casey. Glad you like it. So if there are if there aren't any other questions, remember. Uh, oh, here's another one. What sort of basic things do you recommend to stop or detect these enumeration techniques? To be honest, you cannot do much. Um, because there are registry reads by multiple processes. Now, if all of a sudden, uh, probably one thing you could do is uh, profile on your system, let's say with a tool like Sysmon, what are the processes that should be reading these registry keys, and then you exclude those processes to be shipped over, uh, those logs for those processes to be shipped over, and then you can alert if some other process is trying to tamper with those registry keys would be uh, my recommendation there. Uh, another question, but thank you for creating and sharing. Awesome. Uh, this one, awesome. Thank you for the modules. You keep bringing up Endgame. Would you recommend this? I have to be honest, uh, I'm kind of a bit biased since I know Devon Keys and I, I know some of the guys over there. And I know that they work very close with Sub-T and the guys from Brett Canary. Uh, but the times I've tested their tool and played with it, when configured properly, it is a pain for an attacker. On the insert response side, it is a very, very good tool. It allows you to query quite a bit of information and it simplifies the insert response process. Does your team use similar recon toolkit when using C2 frameworks like a ball strike? Yes. Yes, we do. In fact, that's one of the petitions that I got today from Martin Bose is for me to start moving some of some, if not almost all of uh, some of our Rick and toolkit and make it public sanitize some stuff. For example, uh, I like stuff in certain formats saved in certain ways uh, that are internal to us. Uh, and he asked me, Hey, Carlos, we want to keep sharing with the community. We want to keep putting stuff out. Uh, can you start putting some of our aggressors scripts and .NET binaries out there also? Um, so that was a petition that I got today from Martin Bose. Um, he's my boss's boss boss. So he's three levels above me. So he asked me if, if I could, to me that is, go do it. <laughs> um, what about the managed product of Endgame? You recommended, uh, to be honest, I haven't tested it. Uh, base, uh, basic, this tool gives a look on host uh, before an attack actually gives you information once you land into the host how should you behave inside of it it, it is just giving you situational awareness and giving you how oh, okay, to threat assessment of what are the controls on in the box and you can use this to di dictate what tools are you going to be bringing over into the environment and how fast a, are you going to move in the environment itself uh, so it's going to dictate tools and tempo. 
How do you feel about Palo Alto traps and point? Have not played with it. Um, sadly, many vendors are not open to sharing uh, their tools with uh, with vendors outside of the guys from Endgame Silence. Um, I, it's been difficult with others. Uh, I'll rather not mention. How did you arrive at the name Honey Badger? Well, that's actually, that's a nickname that we had for Dave. Um, Dave is cuddly, and but he can also, uh, he'll bring his Marine out when needed. So um, th that's a, a nickname that we had for him, Honey Badger. So I'm like, hey, we keep pulling multiple names out there inside uh, NSA-esque names inside of our tools. Just let me name this one and I'll name it Honey Badger just for giggles. And that's how it came. Will Honey Badger ever make it into the MS Master branch? Um, so far, no. I'd rather keep it with uh, here because it means that I have a faster development cycle to add stuff to it as I want to make it public. In the case of uh, Metasploit Master, it means that it has to go through an approval process. I need for somebody other than me to look at it, validate it. Uh, it's going to get bounced back for, let's say, a spelling mistake or, hey, you didn't do this because this is the style that I like. And then it becomes a bit difficult. Uh, and I know why they do it, because it goes then into a product, which is the Metasploit Pro. They feed from it, but uh, the process of getting stuff inside of uh, MSF Master is a very long and tedious one. I came in a little late. Have you tested it against Sentinel-1? I have not. Uh, any honey badger issues with MSF or Kali updates? Not that I'm aware of. Um, because typically you'll grab this and you'll put it in your .msf4 folder and it works pretty well. Uh, test it against CrowdStrike. Uh, I think we did. Some of this stuff we tested against CrowdStrike, but from, um, not from Metasploit, but the same technique, but in Cobalt, uh, in Cobalt Strike via aggressor scripts, and it works because we're just reading registry keys. It didn't trigger any actions. Do you have a block about this tool that is coming shortly? Uh, that is one of the things I have to, now that I did the, the webinar, I need to sit down and do a blog post on it. Sorry if you covered this already, but I joined a few minutes late. Will a copy of the slides and video be available? Yes, for those that registered, you will be getting a copy of the videos. Uh, the slides is only like, like one, two, three content slides. The other are marketing slides. Uh, but we'll get those to you as a PDF. And I'll be working on the blog post very shortly on, on this uh, with a bit of tutorials on how to place it there. And I'll be working also on the wiki. I, I, I complain to my guys when we write tools and we don't document them. And all of a sudden I push this project and there's no wiki. So I'll be creating a wiki. I'll be putting more content here in the readme file. Um, I'll be documenting each one of the individual modules for you guys to leverage uh, with some tutorials and, and make all of that available here in GitHub for you guys. So you, get, you guys can just start the project, subscribe to it, and new stuff gets pushed to it. You guys will get notified. In fact, I just see, saw one mistake. This file goes in here. Uh, I'll fix that in a bit. As I mentioned, I said it's in development. <laughs> Uh, Derek says, I need an internship with you. Hey, we have, uh, we do internships. Um, I don't know if the window closed for the interns for this year, but every year we do interns. In fact, uh, one of my recent interns actually got hired uh, in, inside of the force team as one of our pen testers, which was awesome. So yes, we do internships. Just be uh, on the lookout for when we, inform that in Twitter at TrustedSec. And once, and you can actually say, hey, I want an internship with the research team. I want an internship with the red team. 
I want an internship with the um, force team, which is our red teaming, our pen testing one. I want an internship with the is it response team. Awesome. Got quite a bit of questions. 20, 26 questions in total. Uh, any other question, guys? If not, I wish you all a good day and we'll stay in touch in me in social media and through the GitHub project. Hope you guys find it useful.